Welcome to EPG Paatshala. I am Asha Kothari Chaudhary and I am a professor of English at Guwahati University. The course we are looking at is Indian writing in English and we are looking at the unit on drama and our focus today is on the module that looks at trading the human body, Manjula Padmanabhan's harvest. The author we are looking at is Manjula Padmanabhan who was, who was born in 1953 and, and is now a Delhi based writer and artist who has a number of plays, novels and short stories to her credit. She is one of the contemporary Indian playwrights who writes originally in English. Padmanabhan has been awarded with the Onassis Award for Theatre for her play Harvest. Among her other important plays are Lights Out and the two plays Lights Out and Harvest are her most important contributions to the world of contemporary Indian theatre in English particularly. Lights Out deals with the issue of sexual violence against women in India and it is based on a real story that happens to have taken place at Santa Cruz in Mumbai. Harvest is a play that deals with the issue of organ selling in India and therefore is an important contribution to the huge ideas that are now being contested in terms of bioethics across the world. With Hidden Fires, Padmanabhan in a collection of monologues explores the various forms of violence and disorder that have engulfed our society. This collection comes in 2003. In Kleptomania, we find a collection of brilliant and insightful short stories that represent the ethos of urban India. In Hot Death, we have a collection of further short stories. Travel memoirs are also something that Padmanabhan writes and there is the book called Getting There. Among her collection of comic strips, for she is also a cartoonist, we find a book that has been published entitled This is Suki. A quick understanding of what Harvest is all about before we begin to explore the play in depth. Set in Mumbai in 2010, the play takes us to the tense apartment of a poor family in Mumbai and deals with stories of Om, the chief protagonist of the play and his family members. Harvest is known as a futuristic play and is understood to have this extended vision uh, to 2010 that represents the confinement of a middle class Indian family of the third world obviously to the tempting but illegal global economy of the first world. It is a play about an Indian family whose family members are ready to sell their body organs to the organ buyers based in the US. So some of the major themes that are, we are going to explore in this play, uh, Harvest, are 1. Organ trade and its impact on the poor sections of our society. 2. Poverty and the ethos of the third world con countries and the people that pushes them into such practices. 3. How can poverty uh, limit the moral options of people and bring about a degradation of human values and lives? And number four, technology and its adverse immoral impacts on human life. We are also going to be considering finally in the broad base of the term uh, issues of bioethics that underlie the whole conception of this play. Let us now look at Manjula Padmanabhan's Harvest uh, in depth. Manjula Padmanabhan's Harvest is based on the existing issue of organ trade in India and set in Mumbai of 2010. It takes us into the tense apartment of a poor family living in Mumbai and centers around stories of Om and his family. They live in a cramped one-room apartment and the whole family lives in strange sorts of tension and privation that comes about mostly from poverty. Om Prakash is unemployed, he's a clerk. His wife Jaya 
has accepted this life of privation and insecurity. Om's old mother is a frustrated and self-centered old lady. His younger brother Jitu works secretly as a gigolo. Harvest projects the picture of a family which is surrounded by conflict and mess. Within this family, Om and Jaya are maintaining an unstable marital relationship. And in actuality, Jaya is carrying on a secret affair with her brother-in-law, Jitu. In Om's mother, we see a selfish woman whose love only extends to the eldest son, Om, because he happens to be the breadwinner. She is also jealous of her daughter-in-law, Jaya. Now, all these four characters are locked in a loveless and artificial bonding that turns their world into a claustrophobic four-wall of a one-room tenement. Thus, amidst economic setbacks and emotional deprivations, Om takes the lead to find out a kind of solution to end all their miseries. To sustain his family, Om decides to sell his organ to an international multinational company in return for a limited amount of money. Om is hired by the multinational company called Interplanta to donate his healthy organs to a well-to-do receiver belonging to the West. Harvest is often referred to as a futuristic play with its extended vision uh, to 2010 that represents the confinement of a middle-class Indian family uh, to the tempting but illegal global economy of the first world. It is a play about a family whose members are ready to sell their body parts to the organ buyers in the US and Harvest shows the futuristic picture of modern times when machines will replace human beings. It is seriously concerned with issues thrown up by bioethical concerns. The title of the play is especially interesting because it uses the analogy of collecting up or gathering up crops. In this context, the title Harvest seems to be apt as the play deals with the issue of buying and gathering of human organs in India by certain groups who sell these organs uh, abroad. In the play, the members of the Om household fall victim to this flesh market, which is controlled again mostly by the West. However, harvest is not only about human organ trade or how it affects the poor. It is also about the overriding presence of technology that intervenes in the human world and finally begins to govern it. The play represents the battle between a man and a machine for the possession of human beings and how the financially strong groups and agents take advantage of the modern electronic technologies to control financially weaker sections of society. The play begins with Ma and Jaya waiting for Om's return from his daily job hunting. Both are concerned about Om getting a job because otherwise they will not be able to survive. Om has lost his previous job because of his lack of expertise in computer skills. We immediately have to notice that Padmanabhan here is bringing into the discussion the influence of technology that plays such an imperative role now in the lives of poor people like Om who are unskilled in computerized technologies. Simultaneously, the same technology again is seen that is being used to fool people like Om to sell away their organs. The description of the selection procedure for Om's new job bears witness to the fact that technology is now used to deceive the poor people by uh, corporate multinational organ buyers. Om is selected for his new job where he has to now play the role of an organ donor. Thus, the beginning of the play now introduces the reader into a dark world of institutionalized organ trade, which is very much open in the third world countries. It mainly operates from countries which used to be colonies of the Western world. As Oliver Decker has pointed out, organ trade has become now a worldwide business 
in which not only the sellers and buyers of organs, but also middlemen, hospitals, physicians are involved. He cites Turner's observation here, according to whom, in contrast to most nations' marketing treatments to international patients, the Philippines, for example, differentiates itself by selling all-inclusive kidney transplant packages. The patients from other countries travel to Philippines and receive kidneys purchased from poor individuals. Thus, the commodification of the human body has become obvious and gradually started to acquire a legitimate status in the name of erasing poverty. In Harvest, Padmanabhan deals with this commoditization of the healthy third world body with the help of significant advances in transplant technology. Thus, the third world becomes a storehouse of healthy human bodies, a bank of spare parts for ailing human bodies of the first world. The wealthy yet ailing patients in the first world are increasingly turning into healthy yet poverty-stricken populations of the third world in order to produce spare body parts, which is nothing but another means of exploiting the third world encouraged by global capitalism. Now, these third world bodies are easily available and ready-made products that can be sold and bought easily. They do not require any extra effort or labor to be produced. The poor sections of Indian society will willingly sell their organs to the opulent receivers to get rid of their poverty. It is like making money by selling organs, the money which they will not be able to make at the cost of their labor and uh, expertise. In their essay on Millennium Capitalism, First Thoughts on the Second Coming, Komarov and Komarov define it as a kind of capitalism that presents itself as a gospel of salvation, a capitalism that, if rightly harnessed, is invested with the capacity wholly to transform the universe of the marginalized and the disempowered. The key understanding of millennialism capitalism lies in the particular brand of seduction upon which it operates. The seductiveness is what makes this organ trade possible and makes the third world individuals see their bodies as a site which actually contains natural spare parts that are in high demand and they end up selling these spare parts such as kidneys or corneas to solve their financial problems. Hence, we have a play like Harvest that shows that human organs are precious commodities that is not produced by the laboring human body but can be rather extracted from it. It is a commodity because it has a use value. The body is mined for its organs and finally harvested. Organ trade has become an open and institutionalized trade in India where the donors constitute the third world population while the receivers are from the first world countries. In Harvest, we have three Indian donors belonging to the same household, Om, his wife Jaya and his younger brother Chitu. But Manaban creates these characters in order to interrogate into the particular circumstances that compel people to do what they do. Having passed the medical tests at Interplanta, Om is now considered eligible and a healthy candidate for selling the rights to his entire body to an anonymous buyer in the United States. In his selection interview, Om has lied about his family, saying that he is unmarried. But the receiver's party is smart enough to detect his lie and eventually they target the entire family, including his brother Jitu and his wife Jaya. A complex feeling of hope and despair becomes apparent in Om's face after signing the contract. Initially, he is very excited to get a new job for which offers him unexpected fiscal support. He even goes on to defy Jaya's interventions in this matter and says, You think I did it lightly? But we will be rich, very rich, insanely rich. But you'd rather live in this one small room, I suppose. But the actual situation which compels him to sign the contract becomes clear when he says to Jaya, 
I went because I lost my job at the company. And why did I lose it? Because I'm a clerk and nobody needs clerks anymore. There are no new jobs now. There's nothing left for people like us. Do you know that? And across references from such dialogues that we find in Harvest, we see that Ohm's decision of signing the contract has been mainly pushed by the thought of improving his family's lot. And to do so, he has to put on uh, blinkers to the actual reality of the situation. He becomes aware of the consequences of his decision and then he is horrified. He says, how could I have done this to myself? What sort of a fool am I? Here again, Padmanabhan shows the amount of seduction that is associated with this trade that provides a quasi um, magical means of making money and surfaces with the actual reality. For example, initially Om's mother does not know anything about what Om is going to do in his new job. But when she begins to get hints as to what Om's new job involves, she's not bothered about, um, about her son. She is more interested in all the things that she will be able to now acquire. She says, well, so long as they don't hurt you. Unquote. As the narrative progresses, we find that Ma has become accustomed to her luxurious life with an array of gadgets provided by the receiver Ginny in order to keep the donor's family happy. Her life is now completely governed by technology. This unexpected reversal of fortune and the sudden outpouring of comfort and luxuries make her blind to the real realities. Not only has Om sold off his body to Ginny, but he has also sold his and his whole family's freedom to Ginny. Now Ginny can observe what the family members do at home. The pa receiver's party has installed a contact module through which Ginny can observe the activities of the donor's family. Here we find Ginny controlling the whole family without actually being physically present. And we see how she enforces her power on the Ohm household through technology-enabled surveillance devices. It is an echo of what Jer Jeremy Bentham had once called the panoptic power. The underlying principle of panopticon is the total and constant surveillance of inmates, patients, workers and general people by controlling them mentally. According to Bentham, it is a new mode of obtaining power of mind over mind. It is a power that controls you mentally without using any physical force and it is the body that is at stake in this functioning of power. By using this mechanism of the panopticon, surveillance can be exercised in such a way that those who are being supervised cannot tell whether they are being supervised or not, as Foucault has pointed out. The mechanism of power can be applied to any sphere where some kind of regulation is required and it can be applied via tools like closed circuit television, cameras or what we now refer to as CCTV. It is the disciplinary power, a power that operates without actually controlling another person. In this play, Ginny does not appear on stage. But she is like the omnipotent God, regulating and governing the world of the donors. And Ginny does it purely from the perspective of her own profit, because she wants their organs to be healthy, so that when she uses them, she is not going to be in trouble. For example, when she comes to know that one family member uh, in Ohm's family shares a sing single toilet with another 40 people, she cannot accept it and immediately orders the interplanter services to install a separate toilet at Ohm's house. Thus, there is the establishing of a permanent module of surveillance at the donor's place and Ginny tracks each and every move of the residents. Out of fear and obligation, Ohm urges his family members to police their own behavior. In our time, we are also familiar with how so much of this is become in, in terms of popular television and reality TV, uh, also another interesting feature of how 
popular life of the people has incorporated ideas of surveillance in them. The picture of the human trade here now becomes very clear when Ginny says to Om, I get to give you things you would never get in your lifetime and you get to give me, well, maybe my life. Unquote. Here Ginny's speech reveals the inequality involved in this business. She provides material things, but in return she receives life itself. It is an investment she has made to get back her life. Ginny wants Om to be happy and smile because only then his body will remain healthy and so also the organs. It is like harvesting a particular body part from the whole body or from the land. Like the crop extracted from the land which is a commodity, Om's organ has also become a commodity with real user value, a profitable part. Like the way we take care of the land in order that we may have a better harvest, Ginny is now taking care of Om's body, the fertile land that will produce the most crucial harvest for her. Thus, all members of Om's family fall prey to Ginny's plan except for Jaya, who realizes the price that Om is going to pay in return for all of this luxury. She opposes his move and the tactics of deception, but Om does not listen to Jaya. Finally, it is not Om, but his ailing brother Jitu, who falls prey to Jinni's tar. When the guard comes to receive the donor, Om is away and Jitu is easily available. Despite Jaya's interference saying that he is not the donor and Jitu's appeal that he is not the donor, the guards take him away. When Jitu comes back, escorted by the guards, his eyes are no more and the guard informs them that the transplant has been tremendously successful and hence the donor's family will now receive every benefit and consideration due to them under the terms of the contract. Once again, the organ is extracted. The body of the donor becomes useless, for the receiver now becomes a disposable body of no use to anybody. And Jitu is the first victim of this horrible trade. Harvest not only represents the presence of organ trade in India, but also represents how it affects the physical and mental health of the poor don donors, how the poor section of our society has become a pawn in a game played by global capitalism. The inequality between the rich and the poor upon which organ trade is based and also the violence associated with this trade come to the light when Jitu says, a rich woman who plucks a poor man's out, eyes out of his body Hmm, that's not a woman, it's a demon, unquote. The guards from Interplanter Services come for the second time to take Jitu to cut off his other part, body parts, which Jitu happily accepts now because he finds himself in a situation which is beyond death, perhaps worse than death. In the final scene, we find another American receiver, Virgil, who comes to prey upon Jaya's body. But Jaya straight away refuses to negotiate with his absurd demands. Virgil wants her to give birth to a baby because according to him, they have lost the art of having children. He wants Jaya to do it without making any physical contact whatsoever with her. But Jaya wants him to meet her in reality. She has her own preconditions to Virgil which he does not accept. Instead, he sends his interplanter employees to break down Jaya's door and implant the device in her so that Jaya might become pregnant without having any real human intercourse. Jaya has adopted a different name of fighting against these devices. She decides to win by losing and moves to welcome her death. She wants their advance by holding a knife against her throat. And the play ends at this unresolved juncture. Thus in Harvest, Padmanabhan shows 
that the exploitation of the third world population by the first world is still dominant and comes in different disguises. Organ trade is one of them. Organ markets run by the first world takes advantage of the poverty-stricken population of the third world who do not have anything else and have no option but to sell their body parts. Harvest demonstrates that this modern trade of selling human body parts can be understood in terms of the existing gross material inequity between the first and the third worlds. Amid such an unequal world and the abuse of power by the rich and the powerful West, there is a section of people, uh, however, who, like Jaya, despite being poor, do not succumb to this lure of money and won't want to hold on to their dignity. The play ends with a question mark. How does this exploitation by the rich of the poor be found acceptable at all? Is embracing death uh, a solution to this problem against uh, the weaker section of humanity in different parts of the world? The audience is left with so many unanswered questions to contemplate upon. So in this module, we have considered Harvest, the play written by Manjula Padmanabhan, one of the leading women playwrights of uh, India, who writes in English, where she has portrayed the picture of a dystopian world. This dystopian world is just the opposite of what we would deem life to be in a perfect, ideal or a utopian world. Harvest projects the picture of a world which is completely dystopian in nature. The rich here will use and abuse the poor to fulfill their own interests. And the poor here are required to sell even their body parts for a bargain, for a few pennies to lead a slightly better life. It is the picture of a cannibalistic future that we find represented in Harvest. Along with our organ trade, the play also deals with the overriding presence of poverty in the third world countries, which is also a social problem that has overriding kinds of imminent presence in India. The play also brings into discussion how poverty can limit the moral options uh, that the people have and degrades human values and lives. The other factor that is explored in the play is the immanence of technology and surveillance and the fact that it is through technology that the first world is able to control the third world. Harvest, therefore, is a well thought out critique of the organ trade, of global capitalism, of bioethics and the issue of the commoditization of the third world body. Thank you.